Good morning. Bless us because we need it. Good morning. Just so everyone knows, you are in the insurance subcommittee on life and health. And before we get started, um, let's see. Representative Hawkins is going to give us a word of prayer. Please bow your heads. God, Father, we come before you today uh, with the issues that we face and solutions we must come with. Please lay your hand upon us. Help us with these decisions and make the right decisions for the citizens of the state. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. All right, our first bill, if you'd go to the podium, please. Representative Camp, we'll be looking at House Bill 1324. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I appreciate you hearing this bill. Um, we're looking at LC 339001, and it is House Bill 1324. This bill is very near and dear to my heart as a former emergency medical technician because um, basically what this bill does, if someone goes to the emergency room because they feel like they're having a cardiac episode of some sort, and it ends up that um, test proved that it was something else, um, perhaps it was um, your gallstones or um, you, know, you ate something bad, but for all intents and purposes, you believe that you are having a cardiac episode, then your insurance company would be bound to pay for the medical services rendered. Um, this bill hopefully will allow people who may be hesitant to go to the doctor for fear that they're not having a cardiac episode, for fear that they're going to be held with a huge bill. Perhaps this will make sure that we save some lives. I'm open for any questions. Thank you. Does anyone have a question? For the yeah. You have a question? Yeah. Um, Representative Camp. Yes, sir. Isn't it true that this bill was brought to extend the language and protection uh, of interim final and other diagnoses because there were some problems um, even with the layperson language we, that we had already in, in uh, code? Yes, sir, that is correct. And this just clarifies so there is not any um, various interpretations of that previous law, a previous um, language. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yes, go ahead, Representative. Uh, rep Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Camp, I want to first commend you for bringing this legislation, especially for you redefining emergencies because you also included mental health, a mental condition. So uh, my hat's off to you for redefining that and including that into this legislation. And also on lines 44 through 47, it talked about the penalties for non-compliance, exactly what is the penalty if the uh, insurance company doesn't comply? Well, based on the information that I've had, um, failure to comply will, um, well, I don't have that language specifically in front of me, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, Sarah from Legislative Council is available if she would further go information with that. Could you go to the microphone, please? Yes, ma'am. The penalty um, are in 33-224, and it's 2,000 per violation, unless they knowingly did it, which would be 5,000 per violation. And it's interpretable whether a violation is, that's interpreted that can be interpreted different ways, whether it's per policy, per incident, per whatever the, that's up to debate. Thank well, you. Thank you. Once again, I want to commend you for some good legislation. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I don't see any. Thank you very much for bringing Madam your Chair. bill. I'm sorry, online, Madam is there someone? Shannon? Yes. Okay, please Thank go ahead you, and ask your question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a quick question for the bill sponsor. You mentioned about 
um, cardiac issues, but this bill makes clear not just for cardiac issues, but um, all issues in general. Is it just basically saying that we're not expecting people to self-diagnose correctly and that they're seeking medical care because they need it? That is correct. Um, typically, if, if you call your doctor's office, the first thing you hear on the message is if you're having an emergency, please hang up and dial 911. If people feel they're having an emergency, then that's exactly what they need to do. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions online? Thank you very much. We appreciate you bringing your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, next, um, Representative Williams, if you would come forward to the podium. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I'm here today to present House Bill 1308, working off LC number 520046. Basically, this is a communication bill. Um, what we would like to do is um, a plan sponsor of a health benefit plan to consent on behalf of an enrollee to have electronic delivery of all communications related to the plan to allow the enrollee an opportunity to refuse to agree upon to receive mailings electronically and to provide for related matters that provide for an effective date and applicability to repeal conflicting laws and other purposes. Also, when we talk about a health plan um, at open enrollment, you know, we're, we're all running, running to all these different groups for open enrollment and for these health plans. And when I just talk about a health plan, I'm talking more, it means a policy or a contract or a certificate or an agreement upon the group or the employer and the employee um, that's offered by, and not only health insurance, but it's also including vision and dental insurance. So in a nutshell, basically, the employer can send out this electronic enrollment information and this um, certificate information to the plan um, employees, and they can correspond electronically. Or we do have some folks that just you know, do not like computers, do not like electronic communications, and they want to talk to someone face-to-face -face or, or you know, look them in the eye and, and when you're discussing um, insurance and that's all this plan does it just makes sure that um, employers are able to do this they can opt out if, if the employee can opt out if they do not want to do this um, but it basically it just makes it you know a seamless transition and um, we have the insurance department that has looked into it and, and it's already going on um, I guarantee you um, Madam Chair lady could discuss she has some groups doing this right now um, but just to hit a couple of highlights before consenting, the plan sponsor must confirm that enrollees routine, routinely use electronic communications. And I think it's key that this is voluntary um, for the plan sponsor and allows individual enrollees to opt out, like I said before. Um, the insurer must still adhere to requirements in the state's Uniform Electronic Transaction Act, including sending paper communications if the enrollee's email address is no longer valid and retaining the date the communication was sent in the email address um, for five years. Furthermore, the insurers cannot cancel, refuse to issue, or refuse to renew any policy because the applicant or the insured refused to agree to receive mailings electronically. And with that, Madam Chair, I will uh, hold for any questions. I will ask, does anyone on the committee have a question? Yeah, I've got one. Okay. So essentially what you're saying is, if we have a patient that ha does not have a laptop at home, does not have internet, then the, the insurer must receive or be willing to take the call to discuss the issue with the patient. That is correct. Sort of a common sense thing, isn't it? Uh, sort of. It's kind sort of hard of. to believe, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. I don't see any other question. Is someone online? Let's see. Representative Shannon? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to clarify about this bill, the way it reads to me 
and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like this would allow an employer to say, let's say if the employer is the plan sponsor, an employer would be able to say, I want all electronic notifications for my employees, and then it would be on the employees to opt out. Is that, that correct? But basically, that is correct. So, because right now, the way it works is the insurance company typically asks you if you want electronic communications or if you want to stick with paper, and the person who is covered by the plan gets to decide that. So, this kind of seems like it would, I don't know, I'm kind of, it, it just kind of seems like it would put the burden on the person to opt out who already does not use email communicate or does not use electronic communications. They'd have to receive that that communication by electronic means and then decide they don't like it. It just seems kind of weird if we're trying to make sure that people are getting communication the way that they want. Um, well, I would I would I'd offer this to you. When employers have open enrollment, the employees have to be present for open enrollment. So they have to make sure they're there. This is just simply saying, hey, if you do not want to do this online, you can have the agent can call you at home, call your cell phone and, and discuss or meet with you personally at another location. It's all this is doing is trying to simplify for larger companies that that offer this already. And it's just, you know, trying to make it um, seamless as possible. One um, clear, one final question. So you're saying this only applies to op this only applies <clears throat> To open enrollment but would not apply to future communications well well this that was an example of open enrollments um, typically when someone has a claim they don't like to email it they want to call you and discuss it and then you can work on the claim issue with them this is simply just talking about um, enrollment and it's talking about communications um, with the employees from the employer thank you yes ma'am thank you um representative did you have them go ahead? For some reason. Um, at the appropriate time, I'd be glad to make a motion. Okay. Oh, Are there any other no. questions? Anyone online? We see none. This would be the appropriate time. Uh, I, I move to pass on. Do I have a HB second? 13. Oh, I'm sorry. We're we're not taking a vote on these. We're just oh, hearing today. Right. But thank you. All right. I have no more questions. Thank you. Um, I do have someone that wants to speak to the bill. Would come to the podium. Introduce yourself. Good morning. My name is Shay Ross Smith. I manage government relations for the Kaiser Foundation Health Plan of Georgia. Um, I'm here just this morning just to speak to what I think is. Um, potentially some friendly language to be added to this legislation. Um, KP was interested in adding insurance identification cards to this as well as an option for those to be sent digitally if the employer decides to do so. Um, so we're just here to bring that to the committee if that's something that um, is amicable and that's all I have. Okay, I will ask the author of the bill. Is that something that you're Amy? Okay, yes. would you like to uh, would someone like to offer an amendment to add that wording to the bill to allow ID cards? Representative Gamble. So just to clarify, uh, the ID cards would be, um, you would have to opt out to receive a paper copy? Correct. Okay. It would be the exact language in the legislation currently. So the employer would make that decision, and then if the individual member wanted to opt out, they could choose to do so. Okay. All right. So, um, Ledge Council, did you um, get that? I'm, I'd be happy to make that amend, um, uh, amendment um, subject to the wording uh, being exactly as you said. I think so, if you included it on line 23 at the very end, um, where it says it uh, has the code section for the opt-out language currently, and if you added the code section, which is the insurance identification card, which is 3324.57.1. Okay. You're making that motion, Mr. I am making that motion, yes. Thank you. Um, we're, we're actually going to have that bill prepared with a substitute to be presented at the full committee meeting. Are there any other comments? 
Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, um, next I have a bill to present, so I will see. Mr. Chairman, do you want to sit here while I do my bill? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I bring you House Bill 1288, LC 432229. Uh, this is a bill that's been heard before in a couple of years ago um, with the Georgia State Retirees Life Insurance. They have a um, clause in there that does not allow for the assignment of benefits for the death benefit. So what's happened is a number of our funeral homes, including some in my community, um, are not being paid for their services. Usually when there is a, a death, you can take and go to the funeral home and have your um, assignment like you do when you go to the hospital. And when there's a settlement of the life benefits, they would issue a check. If you have $10,000 and it costs 5000 for the funeral, they would send either a joint check or a check directly to the funeral home for 5000 And the remaining benefits would go to the beneficiary. What's happening, for whatever reason, it's done by the state program. They're the only one I've seen like this. They're not accepting an assignment. And we've had a number of um, funeral homes that have come to us with this as an issue. I don't have a reason why um, it's just always been that way, but I think this is something we need to look at and make sure that these people providing services are compensated for what they're doing because for whatever reason, family members are not coming back and paying for the funerals. That's how this came about, and um, I think it's something that we need to have direction on. I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right, are there any questions from the committee? Okay. From the committee, no questions, all right. Uh, we will also entertain some um, I think there's someone in the back comment. That wants to speak. Right, that's public comment, not not committee. So, but please come forward to the microphone. All right, identify yourself and um, go ahead with your comments. All right, good morning. Thank you, committee members and Madam Chair. Um, my name is Kelly Moody. I'm with the Employees Retirement System of Georgia. Um, so we administer 10 retirement plans, um, two of which are group term life insurance plans. Um, we've had the responsibility of administering that life insurance plan since its inception. Um, that was in 1963. So for us, the concept of non-assignability of benefits is a common thread across all our plans. The only exception is criminal activity. Um, that's explicitly uh, mentioned in statute. So non-assignability provides significant protection for our members and retirees um, who are entitled to their benefits. So as an agency, we have significant concerns about creating an exception and cracking that layer of protection. So as to avoid creating risks for our retirees, um, we just like some more time to discuss the bill farther with the chair and committee members. All right. Thank Any you. Any questions of the presenter? All right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. All right. Madam Chair, I will relinquish the seat to you. That concludes the bills that we have for this morning, and I appreciate everyone being here, and we are adjourned. <laughs>